how's it going? But uh, I want to do get some stuff out there, so I thought maybe I'll do some run-throughs through Hebrews, and which would be very challenging. I'll just tackle this and just read through it, make any comments that I can, ask questions that I have, and you know it's not going to be something that I've studied into a lot. Just I've read through it before, and whatever comes to mind as I'm reading it, I'll share. And uh, this is just to get me into the scriptures more and to share it with you all. You know, Hebrews is a book where I think that a lot of Old Testament knowledge is really helpful, and I'm not really that uh, acquainted with the Old Testament. You know, I read it, read through the whole Bible once at least, and I've read, you know, a lot of the New Testament over and over and parts of the Old Testament over and over, but, you know, Anyway, it's good to know, you know, history in the Old Testament a lot, to understand Hebrews more, and I really dislike how the extreme dispensationalists will try to make the book of Hebrews, you know, um, it is a book, or it is an epistle or a letter that's written to the Hebrews, it is, it's but um, it's for everybody, and it's not for, like, a certain time in the future or anything like that. It's for, you know, if it, if it was for a specific time at all, I mean, I guess I should correct myself, it was more for the people who it was written to at that time, but it is for all of us to learn from. And, uh, you know, this first chapter is great. I was just looking over it before I started recording here, and the whole thing is pretty much about Jesus Christ, you know, the Son of God, proclaiming His deity, and, you know, that's basically what this whole first chapter is. And so, he wanted to make sure that the Hebrews knew that Jesus was who he claimed that he was. He was the Son of God. And uh, let's just look through it. Chapter 1. God, who at sundry times and diverse manners spake times past unto the fathers by the prophets. So, you know, basically what we have that, that, that is known to us as the Old Testament, you know, the prophets, the minor prophets, the major prophets. Ezekiel, Ezekiel, Isaiah, you know, Jeremiah, some of the major prophets in the Bible, they all spoke of Jesus, and hath in these last, in, the, in these last days, spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. And so, you know, Muslims, Islam believes that you know Jesus was just another prophet. So he says that God spoke to us in the past through the prophets, and then in these days he's spoken unto us by his son. And I think, you know, he instantly goes on to say that, you know, he appointed him heir of all things, and by by whom he also made the worlds. So he, he's not just a prophet, he's already proclaiming his deity. Um So, you know, Jesus would have to be divine to be involved in creation like that and to be heir of all things. Um, you know, in the sense that he's being said of it here, who being the brightness of his glory, being the brightness of the glory of the Father and the express image of his person. And that's interesting because, you know, people who deny the Trinity they might say that the Bible doesn't say anything about the person of Christ or, you know, the person of the Father. And we do actually see phrases like that, or we see, you know, said here, the express image of his person. Um, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the express image of his Father's person. Um, that doesn't mean that he is the Father, but um, basically that... You know, I think it kind of means basically that Jesus in his humanity, you know, the, the glory of God, his deity was seen through him, through the miracles that he did and everything else, um, through the resurrection. You know, we saw that he was divine. And upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. 
majesty a name for the father also a title um, that's an interesting word majesty that also were majestic comes from he had himself purged our sins which is interesting too talking about you know the atonement there and uh, our sins being purged so that's something I kinda wanna look into more what people think about that being said there being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained more and excellent name than they. And so, speaking of Jesus being the Son, I suppose, uh, that as he goes on to explain that, but the angels, you know, were created beings, and you know, false religions try to teach that Jesus was created, and we see a distinction here where he was uh, and you know I guess uh, as I say this reading that in verse 4 it says being made so much better than the angels um, I guess people can probably try to twist that verse and try to use that as saying that Jesus was created also but it just it means that Jesus is better than the angels is basically what it means and why? It's because he is the Son of God. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee, and again I will be unto him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And he's quoting from the Old Testament, I guess Psalm 2-7. We have that there in Second Samuel 7-14. This Bible list those references um, and again when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world and then there we see uh, spoken of Jesus being the first begotten which is also very controversial and I've talked about that in the past but I do believe that Jesus was eternally begotten and I need to make note of that those were studies that I was working on that I need to finish up and go over and I'll do that now, but eternally begotten, he's, you know, eternal sonship, that Jesus, or that the Son was always the Son in eternity, and that the Son was eternally begotten, not begotten in time, like we are, like creation is, um, so th the sense that Jesus is begotten of the Father is not the exact same sense that, you know, one human is begotten of another human. Uh, yes, I guess he already said begotten thee in verse 5, too, so that was already talked about. But And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And so, again, this is not even over. We're almost halfway through it. Um, and he's talking about how, how Jesus is heir of all things. He made made uh, the worlds, whom also he made the worlds, by whom, sorry. Um, that he's the brightness of the glory of the Father. He's the express image he upholds all things by the word of his power. He purged our sins. He sat down at the right hand of God. Um, and he has an inheritance more excellent than the angels. He's better than the angels. He's begotten of the Father. These are all pointing towards the deity of Christ. This is like undeniable that the message is that Jesus is God. He is the Son of God, which means that he is divine. And then, to continue on, talking about the angels worshiping him. In verse 7, And of the, and of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits, 
who maketh his angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Okay, so that, that's interesting too. That's something I want to look more into. The language there is just kind of. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. And then he goes on to talk about the sun again. How the sun is greater than the angels. So I don't know, is he just saying that basically the angels are servants and Jesus isn't a servant in the sense that they are? But unto the sun he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness. And the scepter is the scepter of thy kingdom. So he's eternally the ruler. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Okay. Um, and just when I'm reading the hate, hated iniquity thing, it makes me think of how, you know, I've kind of come to believe the phrase that God says to hate the sin, not the sinner. And, you know, I've debated with people about this, but I do kind of believe that is the message. Even if it seems kind of dumbed down, or if people can fall into error by following that. But I do think that's basically what the Bible teaches. It talks about hating iniquity, and, you know, Jesus says to love, uh, you know, our enemies... But of course, in, in the Psalms, there are you know parts where David talks about hating the wicked, you know, people and stuff, basically. But maybe there's some different things going on there. But that just kind of crossed my mind when I saw that. Hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. So he's anointed. Um, this is. You know, interesting too. It's it's got to be. It's quoting from the Old Testament, and he's trying to tie these two together, saying that this was Jesus that was spoken of always in the past. It was speaking of the Son of God. This was truly who this was meant for. We see the characteristics of Jesus that you know he loves righteousness, just like the Father. Um, you know, he has a perfect, he's perfectly righteous. And it's interesting that it says, therefore God, even thy God. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with oil of gladness above thy fellows. So basically he's anointed over everyone else, I suppose. And it could be speaking of in, in the humanity of Jesus, too, how, uh, you know, like when he was baptized, and basically the Holy Spirit came down, you know, uh, descended like a dove onto the Lord, um, that he was anointed then, too. Um, and thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth the garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Again, we see, you know, he laid the foundation of the earth. We see creation being attributed to Christ. We see... Um, you know, an everlasting eternality being uh, in, in an eternal rule being attributed to Christ. And we see uh, that he won't change, you know, that Christ is immutable. And so these are all 
uh, attributes, you know, of of divinity of that only, you know, a divine person could have. So, but to which of the angels said he at any time, "Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool"? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of their salvation? So that's an interesting thing, too. He says, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And then he says, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister them who shall be heirs of salvation? So he's saying basically again that the angels are servants. But kind of <clears throat> I don't know, I'm like wondering, does this sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Is that kind of like the father serving the son in a sense? Um, that's something that the father wouldn't do for the angels, I guess. Um that's such a high honor. And that's it. So there's 14 verses in chapter 1. And there's still a lot to break down there. It seems like a very small chapter, but it's very high on the deity of Christ. I mean, it might be one of the highest chapters on the deity of Christ in all of Scripture. I don't know. It's uh, it's pretty amazing, really. The book of Hebrews gets a lot more complex than into the Old Testament, and to really understand it really good, you know, it takes a lot of studying, but I would like to just kind of run through it, read through it again, see what sticks out, but uh, I guess I'll end this video now. It doesn't need to be any longer. So thanks for watching, guys. God bless.